uh, but the topic remains the same, guidelines in Europe, and I thank the organizers to have chosen the four most important countries in Europe to discuss, so which are Germany, France, uh, uh, UK, and Switzerland. And um, we don't have a chairman. It will be uh, Andrew Davis and myself uh, discussing this. So we thought we organize it this way, not like it is on the program, that he comes first and I come after, but we do it reverse, because I'm going to start to, with some open questions in the guidelines, and then uh, I will tell you how we have uh, addressed these questions in this part of Europe, and he will tell you how they addressed it in England, and then we are going to, uh, to see if, um, what you think about it. So the open questions uh, we are going to address uh, come from the ESMO guidelines. So ESMO is the European Society of Medical Oncology, so it's good for all of us. And, um, but we have all kind of adapted them to our own reality. So these guidelines were, uh, have come out last year, and I summarized them in a simplified way. But uh, if we very quickly go through them, the ESMO guidelines divide patients uh, with follicular lymphoma into those with low tumor burden and those uh, with high tumor burden. And the low tumor burden you can in turn distinguish in stage one, two, or in stage three, four, and in stage one, two, it is recommended to uh, irradiate these patients with local um, involved field irradiation. Watch and wait is given as a possible alternative option. While uh, in more advanced disease, uh, which is considered not curable with low tumor burden, asymptomatic patient, the, um, the suggested treatment remains, uh, a suggested approach remains uh, watch and wait. As it was said, the best chemotherapy-free treatment. The alternative would be rituximab monotherapy. Now let's go to high tumor burden patients, so the patients who are in need of treatment. And here uh, the uh, treatment is suggested depending on the age, even though there is not that much of a difference. So these advanced stage patients are um, distinguished de uh, uh, depending on the age, as I said. For those who are less than 65, it, you have the alternative of a rituximab combined with either CHOP, CVP, or, or uh, um, bendamustin, but our CHOP is put uh, as first because during the consensus, the majority of, uh, of uh, participants still thought that younger patients should rather receive CHOP. Uh, while for patients uh, who are more than 65, the same regimens are recommended, but a little bit in an other order, and then there is the rituximab maintenance, who uh, is added. Alternatives, you see them here, either rituximab monotherapy or eventually rituximab chlorambucil. Now for the case of the relapse, there is no real guidelines. There is just a list of possibilities. And this list of possibilities includes watch and wait, rituximab monotherapy, retax chemotherapy with or without maintenance, radiomonotherapy, palliative radiotherapy, and some kind of transplant, autologous or allogeneic. And of course, for the patients who are older of 65, the transplant do generally not come into consideration. So this is the general um, picture. Now, which are in uh, our mind uh, the open questions? Open questions are, for example, is watch and wait really still an option in 2015 when we have so many different treatments available? The next question could be, Rituximab monotherapy is suggested at different points in these guidelines, but when should we really use it, or should we use it at all? And the next question could be, which is the best chemotherapy to give on top of rituximab? We, should, we now know we should give rituximab, but combined with what? Which is the better chemotherapy choice? And then, what about maintenance? Is there a role for rituximab maintenance? Are the data really so solid to say everybody should receive rituximab maintenance? And finally, when should a follicular lymphoma patient be transplanted? The guidelines say something, but they can, the interpretation, you know, the, the guidelines are something like the law or like the Bible. It depends how you interpret it. 
So here we have the Bible, but now it depends in every center how we interpret it. So I'm first going to tell you how we interpret it, not in Switzerland, because to get a consensus in Switzerland is impossible. It is, uh, you know, uh, it is a country with 24 cantons, and every canton has his own school system, his own government, he, not, not his own money, but we could one day come to that, but so his own guidelines as well. So I will show you the guidelines that we made up in this part of the country, in the Italian-speaking part of Switzerland, in our in institute. So to answer the first question, is watch and wait still an option in 2015? Well, we all know the old uh, studies that, that have been performed, which have shown that you don't lose uh, any survival by waiting instead uh, of treating immediately. So delayed treatment or immediate treatment doesn't change survival. And the studies having shown that are relatively old. They have not been done with modern studies. They have not been done including rituximab. But basically, we don't really have any reason to think that it is not anymore like that. Um, watch and wait can be applied to patients who are asymptomatic or to patients who do not present signs uh, that make them be considered to have high tumor burden. And this is defined quite clearly. There are, for example, the JELA or GELF criteria, the BNLI criteria, and you see them here. Basically, they are based on uh, the dimension of the tumor, on the mass of tumor, how much there is, on the symptoms, systemic symptoms, or on some other um, laboratory value, value like LDH or beta-2 microglobulin, which gives you the indication that the disease is growing very quickly. So if you have these uh, symptoms or signs, then you should go for treatment. Otherwise, you could do the watch and wait. But the reason, historically, to do watch and wait was because you didn't want to put the patient under the burden of a treatment that has a lot of side effects. So you wanted to delay the side effects as long as possible, because treatment was toxic. Nowadays, we have also treatment that is not so toxic. For example, single agent rituximab. So the British colleagues, they have run this study in watch and wait patients, so patients without symptoms with low tumor burden, and they have randomized them to either single agent rituximab, or, sorry, to either single agent rituximab, one month of rituximab, or one month of rituximab followed by maintenance. And what they have seen that the time to the new treatment or time to chemotherapy was longer in patients who had received rituximab compared to patients who were on watch and wait, which is kind of uh, uh, intuitive. It's easy to think that somebody that is not treated has a shortened time until treatment than somebody who has already been treated. Um, but anyway, this didn't have uh, any impact on the patient's survival. So it remains true, even in the rituximab days, that immediate treatment or delayed treatment doesn't change anything on your survival. Now, the other thing that people fear when waiting is that the patient would transform. Uh, the majority of retrospective studies that have looked at the incidence of transformation could not show that by waiting you increase the risk of transformation. And this was also studied in this study here that I just showed you of rituximab single agent versus uh, um, versus watch and wait, here as well in both uh, the strategies, the incidence of transformation was the same. So to conclude, in our own guidelines, which you see here, we answered uh, the question of the watch and wait in that still, we, for patients with low tumor burden, we recommend watch and wait as uh, the strategy to adopt. The second question is when to use single agent rituximab. We know that single agent rituximab is active. You see here a series of studies that have uh, given rituximab single agent in first line. You see that the response rate is about 70%, and the duration of this response is also long. The, the incidence, uh, uh, the, the, the response rate was considered many times to be wrong, I'm sorry, to be wrong because many were saying, well, these were studies in patients, in groups of patients that included a lot of watch and wait patients. But we have conducted very recently in Switzerland a, a randomized study of single agent rituximab versus 
rituximab plus lenalidomide to the so-called R square. And the criteria to be included in this study was to be in need of treatment according to the GELF criteria we have just seen. So these are strictly patients in need of treatment. And despite of this, you see here that the response rate of single agent rituximab was 60% with 25% uh, complete response rate. So these data were reliable that I have showed you in the previous slide. And as I was saying, the duration of response can also be good, but it depends for how long you give your rituximab. So we have studied this intensively in Switzerland. We have performed two randomized studies. The first one compared one month of rituximab versus one year of rituximab. And you see if you give one year, you double the duration of response. And then we have compared one year to five years. And you see that if you go uh, on with rituximab for five years, the median progression-free survival is more than seven years. So basically, if you keep on giving rituximab, then your response lasts uh, longer and longer. But this is extremely expensive and maybe is not even really necessary to do um, because uh, um, we can also stop and go. But we are going to see that later. Single agent rituximab um, nowadays is practically an option that you can only offer in first line because uh, today everybody receives rituximab in first line also with chemotherapy and uh, for somebody who has already received rituximab the duration of response the second time is going to be quite lower and you see it here. Um, this was the duration of response of rituximab in sub subsequent lines. In first line, the, the duration of response is long, but in second line is much shorter, and in third line is much shorter. So I think this is an option only for the first time. So based on what I told you, in our institution we decided that uh, rituximab monotherapy is an option for first line therapy for grade one and two patients. Now, third question is, which is the best chemotherapy to add to rituximab if you want to give chemo? Now, this, uh, um, this, uh, overall, this overview shows you uh, the summary of five studies that have compared rituximab alone with rituximab, uh, sorry, chemotherapy alone versus chemotherapy and rituximab, and it was the one showing that there is a survival advantage by adding rituximab, so this you must do. Which chemotherapy? We don't know. We have several studies that have compared in the rituximab era different chemos. We have here the Italian studies comparing CHOP to CVP to fludarabine and mitoxantron. You see that there is a um, progression-free survival advantage for the two more intensive regimen, CHOP and, uh, and fludarabine, but the overall survival was the same in the three arms so that really there is no one of the three that comes out to be the best. We also know that some studies have compared uh, CHOP rituximab uh, with rituximab and bendamustine. We have uh, one study that you all know uh, that shows that bendamustine has a better progression-free survival, another study that shows uh, that uh, uh, the two are the same, but basically the survival uh, is the same for both, and again, the difference is uh, mainly in terms of uh, uh, side effects, but we don't really have argument to say that from the efficacy point of view, one is better than the other. The fludarabine, fludarabine has been for a long time used uh, in indolent lymphomas. I think the time of fludarabine is not finished, but is uh, getting to an end. Uh, Matthias Rummel showed at the last ASH meeting the results of a randomized comparison that was performed in Germany, comparison of uh, rituximab fludarabine to rituximab and bendamustine in relapsed patients, and you see that both in terms of progression-free survival and of overall survival, bendamustine comes out significantly better than the fludarabine regimen. What is done in the world? Well, this is the example of the United States in a survey performed uh, uh, in the last years. You see that the American colleagues, they prescribe for a first-line follicular lymphoma in about one-third of the cases, bendamustine and rituximab, in about one-third of the cases, single-agent rituximab, and in the rest of the cases, RCHOP, RCVP, or other regimens. So this is the choice that people does despite the data saying that there is no real difference uh, among the different regimens. 
There is a distinction to be made when we talk about follicular lymphoma, and these are the great three. I think that all what I told you applies to, especially to grade one and grade two. I'm not so sure that it applies to grade three, and this is because of a number of retrospective studies. This is uh, one of the oldest, uh, and it was done in Nebraska, and ne the Nebraska colleagues, they looked at the result of follicular lymphoma at different eras when they were or were not adding anthracycline to their regimens. And you see here the data in the studies or in the eras where they were treating follicular lymphoma without anthracycline. You see that grade three do worse in terms of overall survival than grade one and two. But in the times or studies where they were using anthracycline, grade three has the same prognosis than grade one and grade two. And this suggests that grade three probably needs anthracycline. But this was not distinguishing grade three A and three B as we do today. The uh, Nordic colleagues, they have done a huge job of collecting in the Nord Nordic countries more than 1,000 follicular lymphoma patients, and they have reviewed, reviewed all the histologists and have reclassified them in grade 1, 2, 3A, or 3B, and then they have watched at the survival. And uh, you see here that grade 1, 2, and 3A have the same slope, the same survival curve, while grade 3B, they have a survival curve that is much more similar to the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma curve with uh, uh, half of the patients dying uh, in the first years and the others being cured and on a plateau. Now, if you dissect these, depending if they have been treated with or without anthracycline, we see here in this kind of complicated graph that we have practically all on the same curve the grade one, two, and three A treated with, with or without anthracyclines, while for grade three B, anthracycline, yes or no, makes a difference. So here are the grade three B treated without anthracycline, they all die, while here are the grade three B treated with anthracycline, again, they have this kind of diffuse large B cell curve. From here, you would get the impression that only grade three B need anthracycline, and grade 3A do not. Despite of this, in our center, we have decided to reserve uh, the Arbendamastin, or eventually for very elderly patients, our chlorambucil for the grade one and grade two, and we decided to treat all grade three, A and B, with anthracycline. So this is just to be on the safe side, because it's not always so easy to distinguish between a grade 3A and 3B, and also because grade 3A, we know by experience that they have a, a usually more aggressive um, evolution, and so even if you don't treat them with anthracycline immediately, you will soon be adding the anthracycline at the first relapse, which is going to be not too delayed. So for these reasons, we decided uh, to do that. Is there any role for rituximab maintenance? This is uh, the curve uh, of the um, PRIMA trial. I'm sorry, the curve here doesn't... No, it, you, you can see the yellow, right? So the, what we know is that the progression-free survival is significantly better for patients receiving rituximab maintenance. Uh, but basically, the overall survival is uh, the same, and it was still the same at the last update of the data. So it depends what is... Uh, uh, the thing that is most important for you and for your patient, and you can discuss this with the patient, is progression-free survival more important, or is being off treatment and without side effects more important? So this is kind of uh, free. <clears throat> there was a meta-analysis trying to see if there is a survival advantage by giving maintenance. This meta-analysis is difficult to interpret because it puts all together a number of studies where maintenance was done with different schedules in different patient population following different treatment, either rituximab single agent or rituximab with different kind of chemotherapy. So it is difficult to interpret. It kind of suggests that in first line there is not a significant survival advantage. If for patients in relapse there is a tendency to survival advances, but this is all what we have as data. This is what I was talking about before. 
if you want to give lituximab for a long time, you do spend a lot of money, but not necessarily you change uh, the prognosis of your patients. Because we have two randomized studies where the experiment was to give patients either one month of rituximab and wait until relapse, and then give again one month of rituximab and wait until relapse, and then again. And this was uh, the stop and go strategy. And then the other arm of the trial was to give continuous rituximab maintenance. And um, even though patients with the continuous rituximab maintenance had a shorter um, time to treatment failure, the, um, sorry, uh, time to the next uh, uh, treatment, the time to the failure of rituximab, so the time to the next chemotherapy, was the same for both treatment arm in both uh, studies, with the difference that in the maintenance rituximab, there was three, more, three times more rituximab used. So because of all this, in our guidelines, we leave the free choice to our doctors if after rituximab and chemotherapy, they want to add maintenance, yes or no. We don't think it is mandatory. So when do we want to transplant patients? We have a number of retrospective observations suggesting that patients with follicular lymphoma, when they do relapse, they do better with the transplant than without transplant. These uh, were the data from the San Bartholomew Hospital showing that patients transplanted, uh, they do better than the non-transplanted, both in terms of event-free survival and overall survival. Unfortunately, we don't have a randomized trial confirming that. Or, better said, we do have a randomized trial, only one, but it wasn't really finished because it had planned to recruit 250 patients. It had to stop after 100 patients. And uh, from these 100 patients, we have a hint, sorry, we do have a hint uh, that transplanted patients have a better progression-free survival than the patients who were not transplanted. The overall survival is nevertheless not statistically significant, probably before because there were not enough patients. But this is all what we have as data to recommend transplant. Um, in, in relapse, in first line, we have four randomized studies, and they are all negative. The first three studies were done before the rituximab era. This study that I'm showing you here is done in the rituximab era, and um, all the studies shows the same. The progression-free survival is significantly better for the transplant arm, but this does not translate in a better overall survival. There is a higher uh, incidence of toxic death. There are higher incidence of secondary leukemia. So even the author of the study suggested that in follicular lymphoma, autologous transplants should be kept for the relapse. What about allogeneic transplant? This is an old study from the EBMT showing uh, that uh, autologous transplant doesn't cure anybody, even it prolongs probably a little bit the survival, but there is no plateau, while allogeneic transplant does have a plateau, but you pay this uh, with uh, many of your patients, almost half of your patients dying at the beginning because of the consequences of transplant, but then if you have survived the transplant, you have a good chance to be on the plateau and to be cured. These are old data. Nowadays, with reduced intensity conditioning, the curve of the allogenic transplant is probably somewhere up here, the plateau, but at the cost uh, of a 50% uh, graft versus host disease and 30% extensive graft versus host disease, and this is not fun to live with. So because of all this, in the relapse setting, uh, in our center, the recommendation is uh, to give uh, high-dose chemotherapy and autologous transplant for patients who have an aggressive relapse, and with this you can mean different things. You can mean that at the relapse the patient is very ill and has a lot of disease, or it is a relapse that appears shortly after the remission. These patients, if they are young and fit enough for autologous transplant, that's what we propose. While we propose the allo transplant only for patients who do relapse after the autologous transplantation. And um, now, these were the ESMO guidelines and our comment to it. But these guidelines don't include none of the new uh, strategies and new therapeutics that are coming. So for example, targeted therapies and immunotherapy. What do we mean by that? 
there are a number of targeted therapies, but the more popular at the moment and the most advanced in the development are those who target the um, B cell receptor pathway. Are, for example, idelalizib, uh, ibrutinib, temsirolimus, the B cell 2 inhibitor, belinostat, and um, some of these uh, are already on the market. And what do we mean by immunotherapy? By immunotherapy, we mean mainly the monoclonal antibodies, the naked monoclonal antibodies, the radioimmunotherapy, the immunotoxins. Mm -hmm. But today, and in this meeting, you have heard already, and you will hear a lot about other types of immunotherapy, engaging T cells to be active against the tumor. And we, we had in the past interferon. Vaccination didn't really show to be active. But we have immune checkpoint inhibitors, CAR T cell, B-specific antibodies that are coming and that are trying to find their way into the uh, management of follicular lymphoma. Basically, of all this, in our center up to now, we have kept just one, and it is idelalizib which is uh, uh, registered for this indication and uh, which we have put in our guidelines for uh, uh, relapsed patients. And I think with this I've finished uh, and uh, you hear, see here my conclusion. So to summarize, advanced follicular lymph lymphoma remains incurable. Watch and waste remains a good option for asymptomatic patients. Single agent rituximab remains a good possibility for the patients. And uh, <clears throat> Otherwise, the addition of rituximab to chemotherapy does prolong survival, but we don't know which chemotherapy is the best for grade one and grade two. You probably can choose the one that is the best uh, based on the cost effectiveness ratio. For grade three, our chop is, in our eyes, the safer option. Maintenance is a good option, but it's not mandatory. And finally, high dose chemotherapy should be reserved for aggressive relapse. So this was my view, and uh, we will now hear the view 